Thank you everyone again for your patience and welcome to the first Human Rights in Practice event of the semester. If you can quiet down please. Thank you. So our first event of the semester co-sponsored by the Center for International and Comparative Law and the International Human Rights Clinic. And we're very excited today to welcome three speakers, two in person and a third who you'll see momentarily joining us remotely. Um, and I'll introduce all three of them in just a moment. <clears throat> I also wanted to thank our co-sponsors for today's event, the American Constitution Society, the Duke Human Rights Center at the Franklin Humanities Institute, the Human Rights Law Society, the International Law Society, and the National Lawyers Guild. I'll introduce our speakers in the order in which they'll speak, and they'll each speak for about 10 to 12 minutes, and then we'll leave time for questions and discussion at the end, so please definitely if you have any questions, um, we look forward to hearing those at the end. So first we have Dr. James Brudney, Joseph Crowley Chair in Labor and Employment Law at Fordham Law School. At Fordham, Professor Brudney principally teaches labor law, employment law, and legislation and regulation. And his scholarly writing is in the areas of workplace law and statutory interpretation. Previously, he taught at the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law. Professor Brudney also served for six years as Chief Counsel and Staff Director of the U.S. Senate Subcommittee on Labor and is co-chair of the Public Review Board for the United Auto Workers International Union and is a member of the Committee of Experts of the International Labor Organization. Next, we'll hear from Lance Kampa remotely, a senior lecturer emeritus at Cornell University School of Industrial and Labor Relations in Ithaca, New York where he taught U.S. labor law and international labor rights from 1997 until his retirement in 2019. He has written widely on trade unions, international labor rights, and other topics for a variety of law reviews, journals, magazines, and newspapers. And in addition to his studies of workers' rights in the U.S., he has conducted workers' rights investigations and reports on Cambodia, Chile, China, Haiti, Guatemala, Mexico, Sri Lanka, and other countries. And he serves on two federal advisory committees related to his research and teaching. And finally, we'll hear from JJ Rosenbaum, the Executive Director of Global Justice, Global Labor Justice International Labor Rights Forum, a merged organization focused on global value chains and labor migration corridors. The organization holds global corporations accountable for labor rights violations in their supply chains, also advances policies and laws that protect decent work and just migration, and strengthens freedom of association, new forms of bargaining, and work organizations. JJ is an attorney, organizer, and human rights strategist, advocating for human rights, decent work for all, and fair migration. JJ has used legal, policy, and advocacy strategies to win access to rights and collective power for low-wage workers, and has extensive experience with human rights investigations, legal strategies that build collective power, and advising worker, immigrant, and community organizations. And JJ is the co-chair of the American Bar Association's International Labor and Employment Committee, and lectures on labor migration and comparative social justice lawyering approaches at Harvard Law School. And with that, I'm very happy to start with our first speaker, Professor Bredney. Good afternoon, everyone, um, and, and thanks to Professor Fujimura Fancelo and um, the International Human Rights Clinic uh, for inviting me to speak. Uh, it is an honor to appear on this panel with my old friend, however remotely, uh, he's not my old friend remotely, but he is remote, <laughs> uh, Lance Kampa, and my new colleague, J.J. Rosenbaum. Um, in discussing the human rights struggles presented by labor organizing around the world, I'm going to devote my remarks mainly to the international setting and how workers struggle to secure freedom of association rights. Uh, I'll end with some observations uh, regarding the U.S. setting uh, where the struggle is less violent uh, but still quite challenging. Um, let me start, uh, and I apologize if you're all very familiar with this, but I was told that uh, uh, this is a mixed audience. There may be some more familiar than others. Uh, so this is an overview of the International Labor Organization, uh, which is a United States Nations agency established uh, uh, in 1919 by the Treaty of Versailles 
Uh, it has a unique uh, governance structure born uh, partly at least from deep popular disillusionment uh, with governments in the aftermath of World War I, where 8 million soldiers and 13 million civilians died. Um, in the International Labor Conference, which is the ILO Parliament, and the governing body, which is the ILO Executive, each member state is represented not only by governments, uh, but also by organizations of employers and of workers. So the right of participation uh, as representatives includes the right to vote. And that means that uh, the standard ratio being two to one to one, uh, uh, two government, one employer, one worker. So each of the 187 member states uh, uh, in the International Labor Conference has four voting delegates. Uh, the ILO became part of the UN system in 1946, uh, and it remains the only UN agency governed by, excuse me, by a tripartite constituency. Uh, the ILO's mission uh, is to promote social justice through internationally recognized labor and human rights. And since its founding, it has promulgated uh, 190 conventions involving workplace rights and protections, which include what are now referred to as fundamental conventions uh, uh, addressing freedom of association and collective bargaining, uh, equal treatment, forced labor, uh, child labor, and safety and health. Uh, the Conventions on Freedom of Association, uh, Convention 87, dating from 1948, and Collective Bargaining, Convention 98, uh, dating from 1949, have been ratified by 85 to 90 percent of member states, although not the United States, which ratifies very few conventions for reasons uh, we could discuss during Q&A. Um, so while ratified ILO conventions uh, uh, create hard law commitments in theory, they have underlying soft law features. Uh, and there is a sort of naming and shaming aspect that occurs within the ILO itself. Um, <clears throat> the naming comes through the extensive compliance reports and recommendations of ILO supervisory committees, which encourage or pressure governments uh, to adhere to their commitments and there are two especially relevant supervisory committees uh, uh, for freedom of association. One is the Committee of Experts, uh, composed of 20 independent jurists, lawyers, uh, and legal academics from around the world. And it's the only non-tripartite body within the ILO. And the Committee of Experts assesses compliance with ratified conventions based on reports that are submitted by governments uh, and often critical commentary, principally from trade unions and sometimes from employers. Uh, the other supervisory committee relevant here is the Tripartite Committee on Freedom of Association. And the ILO Constitution singles out freedom of association as essential to sustain progress. Uh, and therefore, all governments are expected to comply with Convention 87, even if they have not ratified it. And the CFA therefore reviews complaints that are filed by unions uh, uh, or employers against the government for violating Convention 87. And those complaints will be filed against governments that have not ratified the convention, like the United States or China, as well as uh, governments that have. One aspect of the shaming comes when the Committee of Experts identifies government violations of ratified conventions as especially egregious. Uh, this leads to governments uh, having to appear before the annual ILO conference, again, their parliament, uh, and defend their position orally in the face of uh, uh, interrogation, if you will, from representatives of workers and employers and other governments. There's also been pressure more recently uh, through trade agreements that incorporate commitments to the fundamental conventions uh, and invite trade enforcement measures as part of that commitment. Uh, ultimately, though, uh, ratified conventions mainly depend on domestic law enforcement uh, for effective implementation over an extended period. Um, I wanted to highlight certain key provisions uh, of uh, Convention 87. Uh, under Article 2, workers have the right to establish and join organizations of their own choosing uh, without previous government authorization. And under Article 3, they have a right to elect their representatives in full freedom 
and to organize their activities and formulate their programs free from any interference by public authorities. Uh, the convention is really the bedrock, uh, as many of you may already know, for protection of workers who wish to form, join, or participate uh, in trade unions and their activities to organize, to strike, to collectively bargain. Uh, its provisions, uh, I would say, are substantially adhered to by a number of governments around the world, mainly in the EU, but also parts of the Americas. Uh, and there are recent successes in the so-called developing world as well, uh, where governments have adjusted their laws or practices to expand organizing protections. Um, that said, uh, the big picture uh, is uh, of a challenging gap between the ratified convention uh, and experiences on the ground. Uh, these failures come in different forms. Most distressing and visible is physical intimidation by the authorities uh, uh, regarding rights to organize or assemble or speak in public places. I refer here to assault uh, on the safety and lives of trade union leaders and members where such violence leaves workers murdered or severely uh, beaten and injured and where <coughs> perpetrators are too often unpunished. Documented examples uh, uh, from recent years include, but are not limited to, Belarus, Ecuador, Guatemala, Indonesia, Nicaragua, the Philippines, Tunisia. In addition, uh, there are restrictions on the right to establish and join organizations in direct contravention of Article 2. Frequent examples of that include state requirements that foreigners or workers under 18 are prohibited from joining unions, uh, that there's no right to organize among broad swaths of public sector workers, uh, that workers in export processing zones uh, are excluded from belonging to unions, uh, that there must be a minimum number of members for an organization to be allowed to exist, uh, often 50 or 100, some very large number, and that workers can only join one organization even if they work in more than one establishment. A third broad type of violation involves suppression of trade union activities that are integral to organizing in violation of Article 3. And here I refer to restrictions or prohibitions uh, on the right to hold trade union meetings, on the right of trade union officers to communicate uh, with management, on the right to organize strikes or other forms of protest activity, and on the right to engage in political activities, such as expressing support for a political party uh, best able uh, uh, to defend the interests of members. Restrictions on the right to strike uh, can be especially debilitating given the importance of strikes uh, as a means of securing organizing recognition or forcing employers to bargain uh, uh, or demonstrating to the government the depth of worker concerns. Uh, there are numerous instances where governments uh, uh, restrict or continue to restrict or prohibit workers from engaging in strikes. Recent examples include Cambodia uh, permitting the repl replacement of striking workers and the granting of injunctions to preclude strikes. Ecuador, Moldova, Poland, prohibiting strikes by a wide range of public sector workers, sanitation workers, social security workers, transport, postal, telecommunications. Uh, Kuwait, uh, where the government acted to ban strikes in the oil sector and threatened workers participating in them. And also Indonesia, where the government mm -hmm. has allowed the police uh, uh, discretion to imprison or fine union members uh, for lawful strikes. Stepping back for a moment, one might ask whether the ILO's extensive uh, supervisory process has had a meaningful impact on freedom of association uh, or other uh, human rights protections, given this sort of litany of uh, violations in law and practice. And as a member of the Committee of Experts for the past 13 years, uh, I may be somewhat biased in thinking that my thousands of hours uh, uh, have not been entirely wasted. Um, but I also think this is what is meant by the title of today's session, which is that organizing is a human rights struggle. Uh, and also that Martin Luther King was not just hopeful 
but wise uh, uh, in his now time-worn remark about the moral arc of the universe bending, uh, being long but bending uh, toward justice. Um, one recent example involves China and forced labor. In February of 2022, the Committee of Experts found that China had committed egregious forced labor violations against the Uyghurs. Uh, the committee framed these violations under the convention that deals with discrimination based on religion uh, because China had ratified that fundamental non-discrimination convention but had not ratified the relevant forced labor conventions. There was a fair amount of international press coverage of this highly critical conclusion and analysis from the committee, and China uh, angrily denied uh, all allegations of forced labor. Uh, several months later, China announced that it was ratifying the two key forced labor conventions, uh, uh, allowing for regular examination of its laws and practices under those conventions. And going forward, we should anticipate open and at times aggressive dialogue about forced labor uh, in China between the ILO and the government. Um, I want to close with a few words about labor rights in the U.S. without uh, stealing Lance or JJ's thunder on uh, Amazon or anything else. Um, U.S. labor relations laws, as again many of you may know, have been frozen in place by congressional gridlock for many decades. I mean, when I say many decades, uh, I mean the late 1940s since something serious happened. Uh, I like to tell my labor law students that um, uh, if any other law was <clears throat> Uh, in place before Jackie Robinson integrated baseball or before the start of the interstate highway system, they would be pretty stunned. Um, uh, so what were once viewed as radical protections uh, uh, in the New Deal era have become often impediments to organizing and bargaining in the hands of today's employers and courts, especially multinational employers in our uh, uh, post-industrial economy. Uh, the Starbucks saga uh, makes clear that our laws and practices pose enormous obstacles to the organizing effort without the violence we see in many other countries. Uh, despite Starbucks workers having voted in favor of union representation in more than 280 stores since January 2021, not a single collective bargaining agreement has been bargained. Instead, Starbucks has fired nearly 200 union activists and supporters and continues to threaten reprisal against its workers around the country if they vote in favor of union representation. The National Labor Relations Board regional offices have brought 100 separate cases against the company, alleging more than 1,000 unlawful actions. But even if many of those alleged violations are established, remedies available under U.S. labor law are just inadequate. Crucially, when Starbucks refuses uh, to bargain and was found to have bargained in bad faith, the only relief is an order, order to bargain more. There is no remedy to compel a first contract or to appoint an arbitrator authorized to bring the two sides to an agreement. That is why the unions representing Starbucks filed a 37-page single-space complaint in May of this year before the Committee on Freedom of Association. The unions identify various ways in which U.S. law and practice fail to comport with ILO standards. In particular, the unions contend that the absence of effective and dissuasive remedies under U.S. law allows Starbucks to violate worker organizing and bargaining rights with impunity and that the absence of effective and rapid appeal procedures required by ILO standards encourages Starbucks to engage in excessive delays that further frustrate organizing and bargaining rights. That is currently before the CFA. Uh, let me stop there and hand it over to Lance. That's great. Lance, over to you, please. I'm sorry. That's wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, join this uh, panel discussion um, uh, on an important topic. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I guess the place to start is that um, for, for much of the 20th century, 
many human rights advocates actually saw a distinction between uh, the right to freedom of association and the right to trade union organizing and collective bargaining. Um, everybody agreed that freedom of association is a fundamental right, but you know, many people saw uh, unions and collective bargaining as falling into the area of economic interests and not really rising to the level of human rights. Um, I think we're beyond that now. Uh, a, a consensus has taken shape in the last, you know, 20, 25, 30 years um, that, uh, in fact, you can't have freedom of association for workers, freedom of association in the workplace, um, without accompanying rights to trade union formation and collective bargaining. It, it, it's really, it's a continuum of rights and not a dichotomy. Here. So, so you know that that sets the stage, I think, for you know what what's been happening in uh, recent yeah. years and, and for for this discussion. Um, but it's one thing to enshrine human rights in ILO conventions, which are the main uh, uh, definition of uh, workers' rights uh, with regard to unions and collective bargaining. Um, these rights are also enshrined in the Universal Declaration in the the covenants, the main covenants that flow from the Universal Declaration in, in regional human rights charters. So, so there's a strong contextual basis, a textual basis for uh, uh, recognizing these, these rights. But it's one thing to assert them in writing, in texts, in instruments. Um, but the challenge is to, as Professor Brudney indicated, to effectively protect these rights. Uh, a right without adequate protection is not really a right. Uh, that, that at least a meaningful right. Um, so in the workplace, the main challenge for human rights advocates is really the, the power imbalance between employers and workers. Employers enjoy all the power that goes with ownership, control, authority, discipline, um, while workers are in a position of vulnerability and subordination and ultimately fear um, because workers know that uh, employers can always find a pretext to fire them for violating some company rule or something like that um, when the employer's real reason is to uh, you know, suppress union organizing efforts in the workplace. In this framework, um, organizing and collective bargaining rights require positive steps by government to compel employers to respect these rights. And here the international norm that has been developed at the ILO and, and you know, in the scholarly arena and so on, it, it, I mean, I'm reducing it to a simple uh, phrase, but uh, you know, there's a lot more to say about it. But the, the main standard is non-interference, that employers must not interfere with workers' exercise of these rights to trade union formation and collective bargaining. Um, unfortunately, in the United States, as Professor Brudney uh, indicated, employer interference is, in many cases, the standard response to workers' organizing efforts. And this is why union organizing struggles at Starbucks and Amazon and Apple and other well-known cases are so fraught with human rights implications. Um, and it, it's ironic, it, it, actually, it's maddening. Um, that these very companies um, have in uh, the last two or three years posted on their websites very prominent declarations of adherence to international labor standards, um, citing the ILO conventions and citing ILO and the UN guiding principles and the OECD guidelines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, and saying that they uh, promise to adhere to these international standards. Um, the hypocrisy is just stunning. Uh, <clears throat> take Amazon, for example. Um, workers at Amazon's uh, big warehouse in Staten Island uh, voted in a union election a year and a half ago in favor of union representation. It was only two weeks after Amazon published this pledge about adherence to international labor standards. Um, the company has still not sat down to bargain more than a year and a half later. <laughs> 
Um, and in the meantime, it has fired several key union activists and tied up tied up all these cases in appeals. Um, and in other warehouses, Starbucks hired anti-union consultants to run hundreds of captive audience meetings to just harangue workers about the dangers of union organization and the dangers of collective bargaining. Um, the problem is that many elements of US labor law allow employers to interfere with organizing contrary to international standards. <laughs> The law, if you've studied labor law, maybe you've, if you've taken labor law, maybe you know this, but the law distinguishes between threats of negative consequences if workers form unions. Threats are unlawful, but the law permits predictions of negative consequences if workers choose union representations, as long as the predictions are artfully phrased. So, so to give an example, um, the, you know, Amazon can't call people into these meetings and say, if you bring in a union, we're going to shut this warehouse down. But Amazon arguably can say, if you bring in a union and the union puts us into an uncompetitive position, we may have to consider shutting this warehouse down. You, you see the artful insertion of the, the conditional clause. But what do workers hear in these meetings with the top managers you know, standing up in front of them? They hear union shut the place down, union, shut the place down, union, shut the place down. And this is repeated hundreds of times with a, with a really um, powerful cumulative effect, instilling fear and ultimately interfering with workers' uh, organizing rights. Uh, that, that's, my, that's my own harangue about some of the problems in US labor law. But I, I wanna finish on a different note. I wanna, I wanna you know, it to some extent uh, and share some experience um, and some observations about how to frame um, labor rights as human rights. Um, <clears throat> you know, earlier I said that the anti employers tactics make unions fearful about uh, organizing and collective bargaining. I've done lots of labor rights investigations and reports um, over the years, both in the United States and in uh, other countries. Um, in North Carolina, in fact, I, I spent uh, a lot of time uh, with workers at the uh, uh, Smithfield Foods hog slaughtering plant in Tar Heel um, and with migrant H-2A workers uh, in Mount Olive. Um, and overseas, I've met with workers in many different countries, uh, uh, as indicated in the introduction. The thing that makes the biggest impression on me is, is how certain workers come to the fore as organizers and fighters and leaders in the face of tremendous risks. Um, I, I, yeah, I want to you know, give, give one specific example. Uh, it, it was a project I did in Sri Lanka. Um, and I interviewed a woman named Swarna. Uh, who worked in an apparel production factory in Sri Lanka. <clears throat> she was an outspoken union activist trying to form a union in her workplace. Management ordered the security guards to stop and search her underneath her clothing every day when she left at the end of her shift. They, they, they said they suspected her of stealing cloth to take home and, and you know, work, work on at home. Um, she told me <clears throat> they want to make me quit. They never find anything. The guards who search me are ashamed of what they're doing. They tell me, but they, they tell me that management makes them do it. Um, but I'm going to stay here and keep fighting until we have a union. And you know what? She and her coworkers got a union in that factory. Um, now there's a whole other story. It took some intervention by the brand, you know, by, by a couple of buyers who sourced in that factory. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, it's, that's too long a story to get into. But we used Swarna's account, that story, to move the brands to take action and allow a union to be formed in that plant. Um, I think uh, uh, this is the heart of labor rights as human rights. This is the heart of the organizing struggle as a human rights struggle. It, it's not just the right not to be victimized. Um, it's a right to agency to voice, uh, a right to move from vulnerability to power, uh, from passivity to action. Uh, if we keep this as our human rights guidepost, more workers will be able to exercise these rights and gain the benefits of organizing and collective bargaining uh, 
to make their lives better. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lance. Can you make it where it is bigger? Yeah, some of these slides might be a little hard to read otherwise. I think under a slideshow. From the beginning, I think that'll be perfect. Uh, well, um, thank you to the Human Rights Clinic for hosting this and inviting us. Um, and a particular also appreciation and shout out to the National Lawyers Guild for co-sponsoring. I'm a National Lawyers Guild member, and I'm also on the board of the National Immigration Project of the National Lawyers Guild. Uh, and it's a special honor to be here with Professor Bredney and with uh, Professor Kampa who is also uh, one of the founders of the organization that I work for <laughs> um, and is now on our board as the vice president. Um, and perhaps even, even more meaningful to me, when I was a first year lawyer after graduating law school, I was representing farm workers in Tennessee at Legal Aid. Uh, and I used to drive around doing my intakes and getting my cases ready. And I would carry Lance's report, Blood, Sweat and Fear, which was about the human rights and labor rights intersection. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, uh, you're, you're on the cusp of being able to be a part of this work and change the way uh, freedom of asso association is possible in the United States and around the world. And so I just want to encourage you all to not feel like this is only something that's happening in a classroom at a law school or, you know, um, in some rarefied environment. This is really how you choose to bring human rights analysis into the and international labor standards into the work that you do is a choice you can make every single day um, in your own work. Uh, I work at Global Labor Justice International Labor Rights Forum, a long title <laughs> with labor in the center. Um, it's uh, an organization that brings together emerging work from the worker center movement in the United States, which has been organizing um, in the South and around the United States with workers that were traditionally excluded from US labor law and, its, and how the law was written and its implementation, as Professor Bredney said in the 1930s and 40s, um, in large part in order to get uh, Southern elected officials support for New Deal legislation. And so it's not surprising that farm workers and domestic workers, um, workers that were the gig economy before we had a name for it, um, were often black workers in the South who were excluded and remain uh, marginalized uh, structurally from the law and practice today. Um, that Increasingly now, though, these workers are all a part of a global economy, uh, and workers in other sectors seem like gig workers and have the structures of employment, labor and employment, um, of being separate from your real boss. Um, and so if we think about freedom of association and collective bargaining, we have to open up our understanding of how power works on global supply chains and global value chains. What, kind, what does association mean when it's crossing borders? What do our worker organizations need to, work, need to look like? And that's the work that we do every day at Global Labor Justice with unions and worker organizations around the world. Um, and we do that through campaign, what we call integrated campaigns, which means we bring worker organization and strengthening membership uh, forming unions, helping unions collectively bargain, helping ensure the leadership is diverse and represents the sectors that they're in. Law and policy, which is what you all do every day. Um, we also bring new kinds of alliances and fields and coalitions because we think, um, you know, we need feminists and climate change uh, organizations and all kinds of different organizations to actually win these struggles that we're up against and overcome the power imbalance Lance talked about. Um, and then ultimately new forms of bargaining. So we need collective bargaining, but in order to actually have associational power on global supply chains, across border, across legal structures that are explicitly designed to separate <laughs> workers from the ability to claim demands against their, we call them the real bosses, the people that are making the decisions and have the resources to change supply chains. We need, uh, we need the old and we need, uh, we need an understanding of the real power dynamics. Um, <laughs> we like to think about freedom of association as having two components fundamentally, having it being about democracy and it being about power. And so we need the processes because workers wake up wanting to have power over their own lives in their workplace and beyond. And, and that is what freedom of association is fundamentally about. Uh, so yes, many of the workers that we work with, fishers on deep sea 
boats going out to sea 10 months at a time without the ability to communicate with anyone while they're on the boats. Garment workers facing structural vulnerabilities and supply chains structured that way so that they can be paid less and work in more difficult conditions based on gender and caste. Workers in the cotton fields in Uzbekistan, where in the last 10 years, public sector teachers and office workers were being forced into the fields by their government. These workers have very serious labor rights violations. They deserve a remedy for those rights violations, but they want more than that. They wake up wanting to have a say in their workplace, have agency, have, and you need organization to do that. Um, so I wanted to just talk a little bit in the second part of my talk about an example of what this looks like. Um, and this builds really well off of Lance's discussion, um, well, Lance's mention of the worker Swarna and Sri Lanka and what she wants and how do you get there if you're a woman worker being searched at the gates every day because you're talking to the union and you want to actually have choices about what your workplace looks like. Earlier this year, we, along with partners at the local, regional, and global level, um, were able to reach what's called, we call it a global supply chain agreement. Um, it, we call it the Dindigal Agreement. I always want to say the reason it's called that is because it comes from a rural area in the southern part of a big country. <laughs> so it'd be like calling it the, the Raleigh Agreement, right? A place people haven't heard, for, heard about, a place you might not think that innovate the, some of the most innovative labor law approaches are coming from. Um, so you can see we have a local union that administers the agreement that uh, builds the sh works with shop floor monitors to empower women to take action directly. Um, and that's organizing and consistently there and growing every single day. We have the supplier, which is the, the in, in a global supply chain, that's the direct employer of the workers who are garment workers. Um, and you have uh, the US and Asia regional labor allies, and you have the brands. You need labor, uh, you need labor parties that match <laughs> the global supply chain structure, right? So you have brands in the United States, you need a U.S. organization to help work with them you, and, and work with the U.S. government. You have Indian organizations and Indian labor law. You need people on the labor and the global supply chain that can address that. And then you need regional organizations in a global supply chain where if you have a threat, like Lance said in Amazon, you have a threat that if you raise conditions in India, the jobs will go to Bangladesh or the jobs will go to Sri Lanka. So you need an organization that's waking up thinking about that every day. Um, so, uh, here. Stopped. Okay, that's good, and we can just, I think, um, I want to leave plenty of time for questions and engagement across the panel. Um, so maybe I'll just talk about the fundamental components of the agreement so you can understand. A, collect, a normal collective bargaining agreement, who in here has taken labor law? Anyone? <laughs> a few people? <laughs> normal collective bargaining agreement, right? The definition is you have a worker, you have an employer, and you have an agreement between them. But if you have the employer is, is, is dependent upon someone buying all of that, all of their product at a price and under a contract that is predominantly defined by the buyer, then the direct employer and supplier may not have that much power to actually change the conditions, right? You wanna pay people more, there has to be more money in the contract. You want to give people 50 hours a week instead of 80 hours a week, you have to have more time in the production schedule, right? So the idea here in these agreements is that the buyers agree, and they're part of the agreement, that they will keep their sourcing if the supplier changes the conditions at the workplace. The supplier also knows that if they change the conditions and they commit to being a high road employer, they will retain the sourcing for the period of time of the agreement. And, and that is a fundamental innovation among supply chain agreements that brings collective bargaining forward. The issues covered by the agreement are also important. So this agreement happened in the aftermath of a death of a young Dalit woman um, and fundamentally is grounded in addressing gender-based violence and harassment as part of bringing freedom of association. And the broader unions in the Asia Floor Wage Alliance 
have made it their commitment that addressing gender-based violence and harassment and having a gender justice approach to that is critical to making freedom of association and participation and democracy available for women workers. Um, and so we see those things as intertwined. And the agreement relies on ILO conventions and definitions. So this is also, we think, important if you're thinking about why do we have these ILO conventions? Do states follow them? <laughs> There's all these violations. How does it work? Everything Professor Bredney talked about is very important with the ILO supervisory, uh, supervisory system and the standard setting. But through private agreements, we can also socialize and build consensus around the ILO standards. Also, it, it aids in your negotiations. We don't have to spend days at the negotiating table defining what is the world of work, defining what is gender-based violence, defining what is gender. We can say there were two years of negotiations at the ILO. We're all going to agree, agree on that. Similarly, the freedom of association definitions are encoded into the language of the agreement from the ILO. Um, now, and as we can socialize that, it makes it easier for ratification campaigns at the national level, or it makes it easier to ask brands that are participating in the agreement, hey, like, why don't you support ratification in countries? Why don't you socialize these definitions across your whole supply chain? So we have different geographies of intervention to even, even further mainstream the ILO definitions and concepts. Um, and then finally, just to understand that the, the parties that come together around the agreement have to stay in the agreement playing their roles going forward. So we have what's called an oversight committee, which has brands, suppliers, um, as well as the union labor stakeholders and an independent chair. Um, so while the work is being done day to day by women workers who are fundamentally confronting when there's a problem in their workplace, there's an oversight body that's checking in making sure that's happening, uh, making sure every stakeholder is complying with what's necessary. Um, so I will stop to open it up to questions. Um, and All right, happy to take questions. Um, great, why don't, we, why don't we take these three at the same time um, to make sure we get to everything. So go one, Hannah, you. Uh, as a disclaimer, I feel maybe a little, little bit sharp. Like, so thanks for the professors allowing me to ask that. Uh, I'm from China, so let's talk about China. And I've seen like law students, I like, always think like the labor issues would be pretty far away from them. I would like use like my own experience. Like when I first year working as a top law firm in China, my beautiful hour was about three thousand and five hundred. Yeah, that's my first year beautiful hour. Beautiful hour. Not working hours. And like my friend, one of my friends in a magic circle firm in China, like she forever loses the opportunity to be a mother because of overwork. Another friend of me committed suicide because of the mental abuse and yeah, threatened by another political law firm in China. So and like also like some of my high school, uh, my high school classmate. I don't know whether you remember, like six six years six years before there is a campaign in like Guangzhou, China, about like the Daslan uh, Daslan workers, and like uh, she kind of joined that campaign, and like she was under like supervision of the government for I think last for one or two years, and then like she finally like come come out came aboard. So like my question is like. I'm not funny, I'm funny to nobody, but like, how can like ILO or other kind of organization, organizations effectively like influence and help those people in need? Like, instead of like just, I can use like patronizing and like to condemn a country or government, which you know like is useless because like the social media, uh, like the central part in social media is so strong that can pre can prevent you from like all this like all really like effort. So that's my question. So thanks. Thank you, Anna. Hi. Um, thank you all for being here. I apologize that this is a pretty low level question, but I was wondering if you could just talk about the benefits to workers of being in a union, um, and why you know workers want to unionize, and if some industries are better. 
thanks so much for your presentation. I have a question for Professor Lee, but other members of the panel are welcome to answer as well. Uh, so we we're talking about, I and mean, you were talking about the um, effectiveness of the international labor organization, uh, especially in regards to like the domestic enforcement of property uh, on the domestic level. But I want to take a step back and answer um, with this question. So given the tripartite like structure of the international labor organization, uh, which like sort of like promotes the representative representativeness of the organization. Uh, however, there are countries like China where the national uh, labor organization, or like the national trade union organization, is sort of like formalistic uh, signed by government organizations that are like organized by the government. Like how, like in your opinion, how does that affect the institutional effectiveness, effectiveness of the national labor organization? Thank you. Lance, were you able to hear those questions? Uh, yes. Oh, great. Okay, perfect. Um, mm -hmm. So why don't we open it up to and see who would like to respond? Um, well, why don't I uh, respond to the last question, which was directed uh, at me for the ILO. And thank you for all three questions. Um, I, I think China is not alone uh, by any means in having um, uh, unions that are um, sort of government controlled. I mean, part of what freedom of association is fundamentally about is not just the ability on paper to be able to uh, uh, come together, but the freedom uh, to be able to make your own, set your own agenda. Um, uh, in, in terms of the voting, I mean, you know, there's sort of both um, formal and informal ways to think about this. Formally, uh, when the a country has a government controlled union, then the, um, the union representative in the parliament, the union representative in the governing body is, is a, a, a sort of extension of the government, and that's unfortunate. There are um, battles fought at times within the, I mean, I, battles is a verbal term, I mean, there's not hand to hand combat, but there are questions raised about what is a representative organization within uh, uh, the ILO's concept. and. There is a convention that is about tripartite uh, um, cooperation, and there are sometimes um, uh, struggles that the committee uh, engages in. I'm thinking of one involving Hong Kong and whether China, Hong Kong's, um, uh, the effort by the Chinese Communist Party to control who could sit, uh, who could be the most representative labor organization was hotly contested and became an issue that was brought to the full um, uh, ILO uh, uh, Parliament, but again, this is soft law, so there are efforts to persuade and maybe shame countries into uh, uh, generating a more serious uh, uh, union representation, but until there can be, I mean, this is where trade also plays a role. I mean, to the extent that trade agreements, you know, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Free Trade Agreement has led to uh, significant reform of Mexican labor law so that there are now not, for, for decades, the unions were government controlled unions. Now there is incrementally uh, building a, a serious free trade union movement. And it happened because the United States, and I'll give props to the Trump administration, I mean, it was the US trade representative under Trump who insisted uh, 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 that that there be a, a different structure for uh, labor law in Mexico than had existed. So it's a case by case situation, but I can't say that it's um, uh, endlessly optimistic. Vance, would you like to jump in? Uh, yeah, I'll jump in You know, on the, the question about the benefits of uh, trade union organization and collective bargaining. Um, you know, at one level, it's just uh, ob objectively true that union represented workers uh, earn higher wages and have better benefits um, than non-union represented workers. And, you know, I, I mean, in a sense, it goes back to what I said at the beginning. Yeah, those are economic interests, but where do human rights come in? Um, but I think they do come in because, you know, there, there are human rights texts that talk about a uh, decent standard of living and a living wage and a fair wage and so on and so forth. Um, but setting that aside, I think the more important benefit of unions is, is what I got to at the end of my presentation. It, it's a question of voice and dignity. Um, 
And it's a good thing in and of itself. It's a benefit for workers to um, be able to deal with their employer through collective bargaining on an equal basis, um, our arm's length collective bargaining, where each and each side has, you know, a certain amount of power, but the power, you know, hopefully counterbalances. I mean, I, I think the best uh, result is when you have a strong union and a strong employer who engage in collective bargaining and the, the compromises that come out of that process, out of that collective bargaining process are better for everybody, better for the workers and better for the employer than if one side or the other was able to impose its its will. So so I think this question of dignity and voice is really the the underlying heart of the benefits of union formation. I, I just want to add one thing to what Lance said, all of which I agree with, which is that to the extent that unions become a, a, a meaningful way of expressing voice and as well as economic uh, betterment, they also become a way of uh, strengthening democracy or helping form it. I mean, to the extent that unions are vibrant uh, and workers have found their voice, that voice is not only going to be uh, displayed in the economic arena, it's going to be uh, displayed in the political arena, which is part of the reason why unions get resisted by um, uh, many authoritarian governments, um, uh, because they have a political as well as an economic valence. I just wanted to say, I know law students don't need a lot more reading. <laughs> Nonetheless, um, if, if some of these questions are of interest to you in the United States context, this book called The Future We Need um, was written by two of my shiros, Erica Smiley and Sarita Gupta, about the intersection of race and collective bargaining and the history of the United States. Um, it starts, each chapter starts with the story of a worker and why they wanted to build a union or become involved with the union movement in their workplace, some of the history behind it and some of the places that it's going. So just would really recommend that to people. Um, and then th the only thing I would add to everything that's been said is, in my experience, when I have talked to workers both in the United States and around the world, um, workers, they want agency. <laughs> they want choices uh, at work and more broadly, and they want more equality than they have. Um, and they may or may not have a certain kind of rights framework, although people are very interested, workers are very interested in my experience. You know, the laws we have came from struggles, um, and then they were codified in laws, and then people struggled to change them all. Now, how that happens as a strategy question um, is a very nuanced question, and to the point of do governments respond from um, naming and shaming? Do they respond from inside negotiations? Do you need coalitions with all of it? Those are very sophisticated um, and important strategy questions with very important national um, context as well. Mr. Helfer. So it's a question mainly for Jim, but any of you can answer. First, thank you for a very interesting set of presentations. I was struck by the criticism um, of Xinjiang, which it did not surprise me that the Chinese government was highly resistant. I was surprised to learn, which I did not know, that they then ratified the two forced labor conventions. Could you draw a connection there between the two? I would not have expected those ratifications to follow such a critical report. And I'm not sure what to make of it. So I'm wondering if you could say something. I mean, I, I, I guess I can't, I would agree that it was not what one expected to be the next step in the dialogue between China and the ILO. On the other hand, there are some people who think that what China wanted was to um, be able to respond more um, systematically uh, to the critique and the really bad publicity that followed from um, uh, from all the knowledge we have about what has gone on in uh, Xinjiang and, and for the Uyghurs generally. And so I, I can't be inside the head of the Chinese government about this, but, but it seems at least possible that they, they feel like they would rather be in dialogue with uh, uh, the ILO and others uh, than uh, just be taking brickbats uh, systematically or serial seriatim from uh, uh, from not only the ILO but from uh, global labor justice from others who 
who will do these investigations and generate um, uh, very critical reports. Well, let, let me weigh in here uh, quickly, uh, just to pick up, you know, Jim mentioned uh, trade agreements and, um, you know, the question of China, you know, very complicated and I'm not an expert, um, but I, you know, try to follow it closely. And um, a, uh, a colleague, uh, a Chinese scholar has written a, a, you know, a very important article. I, I don't have it. Uh, I'll, I'll send the link to, uh, <clears throat> to you all uh, later, but um, an article about China wanting very much to join the, the new Trans-Pacific trade agreement, the one that Trump pulled out of uh, right after he got elected, but it went forward with the other countries. And uh, it's very beneficial in terms of trade um, to members of that uh, uh, trade agreement. And China wants very much to get in, but the, the agreement actually requires adherence to ILO core labor standards, including freedom of association. Um, and I, I know, you know, my colleague in China, you know, wrote a, a, a paper t talking about how China is wrestling with this. I mean, it, China's like everywhere else in some respect. There are hardliners and softliners. Um, but, but there are elements in the Chinese labor movement and in the Chinese government that are, you know, looking for ways to be more responsive to international labor rights um, critiques and expectations. Um, so I, I think this is, you know, going to be an important thing to watch going forward. Thank you. Well, thank you all for joining us today. And thank you to our three speakers for such an um, incredibly interesting presentations and discussion.